Hi, I'm Ellen Siegel, and today I'm talking with Janine Vague of Transformative Psychotherapy. So relax into your openness and enjoy this enlightening conversation. Hi, my name is Janine Vague, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Ellen Siegel. Okay, and so today we're going to do a talk about um, intuition, and so I'm going to read just a sentence out of a, a post that came from Daily Ohm yesterday, and it was called Silence, and so the sentence says, silence is the void where we can hear the many sounds that we often ignore, the voice of our intuition telling us the truth. And I thought that was a good way to get started. Um, so do you want to say anything about that, um, Ellen? To <laughs> well, um, intuition, and we can talk about this. Um, I think of intuition as a clear direction or uh, of a certain understanding, a clear choice. Uh, an inner knowing, um, uh, and for uh, people who uh, consider this, uh, themselves spiritual, that still small voice inside, mm -hmm. and um, and I think there are many other innate, innate direction, um, your natural inclination. I mean, I think that there's a lot of different names for it, and um, one of the things I think about as it's, it's, it's like in us and it's available to us and maybe our level of awareness determines whether we access it or not. Um, and I also associate the terms conscious, conscious use of it. And maybe when we're I would say less mature, uh, and that doesn't mean older or younger, uh, that we may be guided by it unconsciously. So those are just some of the thoughts that came to me when we chose this topic. So wherever yeah, we go yeah. with any of it, we'll see. Yeah, and how it works for me is when I was reading that sentence um, yesterday and hearing that, um, I was thinking about, as you know, I do, I've begun to uh, do a practice in centering prayer for the last couple of months, and I've done meditation my entire life, but to me, this felt like more of an advanced level of um, meditation, and if people aren't sure what centering prayer is, it's, um, you, it, it's something that came from a, um, a book called The Cloud of Unknowing, <clears throat> which was written by an unknown teacher, I'm assuming a monk um, or a priest, um, however the right way is to say that. And then, uh, what is it, Father Thomas Keating um, explains it a little bit more, but I was hearing about it on Insight Timer through Methods and, and Maria Golo, and so I decided to accept the challenge. And so um, for two times a day, I sit in silence uh, or prayer for 20 minutes. I'm not praying. I'm just sitting in silence. And um, and so you're not supposed to be using that. That time is just really meant to be silence. So things come into my head. The ego works every once in a while. Um, but where the intuition seems to happen is outside of that silence. So um, throughout the day, I'm finding my you know, I'm finding my my intuition, my intuitive wisdom is getting stronger and stronger from doing this practice, and um, and it's getting stronger also uh, because I'm listening to it, and I'm paying attention to it, and that's the difference between um, intuition and ego. Uh, is that your well, the difference is that you're strengthening when you're strengthening your intuition, you're going to build a you're going to be listening more to your higher higher wisdom than 
if you are to um, just be focused on your ego, which we talked about last time. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm going too much on this. So I'm going to let you take over from there. Well, each thing is a jumping off point. Exactly. Um, in the be happy no matter what material, mm -hmm. um, it's it gets you in touch with that you have an intuition or an inner voice. And um, sometimes it can even give you concrete direction, like get up now, brush your teeth now. Yeah. Make a right turn here. Don't make a right a turn there. Mm -hmm. uh, and how often I'll say in my life, um, I would get a thought, a direction and go, eh, I'll do it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and later on appreciated, you know, if I had done what my inner wisdom had suggested, uh, things would have been much more streamlined and efficient uh, in getting to my goals, whatever they were. Exactly. So, um, because you don't know what the reason is why your intuitive wisdom is saying go right yeah. and and we want to contradict that because in our head we we already had it mapped out that i wanted to go left mm. you know mm. our ego was so set on no but this is the best way to get to uh this particular location um <clears throat> but the ego is telling you to go i mean the intuition is telling you to go right and you've got to trust that ultimately, because there's a reason why you're being guided there, right? And even like when you said just a minute ago, I, you know, I wake up, I'm like, I am hearing wake up and, and brush your teeth. It could be because you're being, you're, it's like the universe is saying, wake up your consciousness, Ellen, because there's something I want you to see in 10 minutes when you look out when you're going to look out your window whereas if you would have mm. slept in you wouldn't have seen that thing out of the window because you slept in and said ah, i don't want to see it and that could have been this moment when the most beautiful sunrise or the most mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. bird just happened to be sitting there on your on your um tree outside of your window or something along those lines um, but it could also be that your your help was needed and you saw something across the street and you wouldn't have seen that if you wouldn't have paid attention to your wisdom telling you, wake up, Ellen, you need to brush your teeth. And that would have caused you to look out the window. So have you found, because I've found this, that as you were saying before, the more I have become open to following that direction. Uh, I'm going to say the more interesting, I mean, I like things before, but it's, it's like being on an adventure that you can become very curious about and interested in like, Absolutely. oh, I wonder what I'll be guided to today or exactly. whose path I'm going to cross and who, what uh, awarenesses I'm going to have. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's a beautiful thing that you brought up. Yeah. Well, um, the ego is, it's, it's trying so hard to fight for control. So maybe what I'll do is um, <clears throat> I'm going to share a little bit about the picture that's behind me. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. So let me bring this up here. Um, this picture that's behind me, it's mm. the Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus. Um, mm. And I love this picture. Mm. So I put it behind me because um, despite whatever you've heard about this painting, what I'm going to say about it is that I saw the Venus as, the, um, as intuition. She's raw. She's naked. She's right there. And on the right and the left, you have the ego trying to take control of the situation. 
So one side is trying to put a coat around her, uh, a cloak around her, and the other side is blowing wind on her to make her cold. So she's thinking she needs that coat. That's what I was thinking when I saw this mm. this morning. And I was thinking that um, <clears throat> we are, you know, we get this intuitive thought that comes up for us, but then something is, is trying to control that thought. So, you know, we want to put the cloak on or uh, because we feel it's too cold outside. Um, but something is telling us, no, just walk out the door. You're needed to walk out the door right this minute. One of the things that occurs to me is that uh, when many of us are children, you know, we follow the direction of the adults, the um, hopefully caring and concerned adults who have some consciousness. But, you know, as generations back further, I, my hunch is that less and less self-awareness, less and less consciousness about the impact of what we as adults put out onto children. And as children, <clears throat> we've taken on the outside uh, direction. And um, some of us were even directed away from our inner selves. Yeah. You know, when a child says, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, what were you and daddy fighting about? And the parent says, oh, no, we weren't fighting. Yeah. And the child walks away going, oh, I, I guess they weren't fighting and I was wrong. And you have enough of those things piling up that mm -hmm. what comes to us as children we really learn to disregard. Yes. And um, I guess in with myself and friends and people that I've worked with, to recover in ourselves, to appreciate that we have that inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. And to some of us have needed to peel off the layers <clears throat> of our own... Um, self-judgment and limiting conclusions about ourselves in order to appreciate that, um, you know, use the term centered, that we are centered in here. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe in a spiritual sense, we're part of a greater whole and we're all one. Nevertheless, we are behind the, the viewfinder here. Mm -hmm. And this one here, and um, and that we have um, impressions and responses and direction coming from within us, actually all the time, and we ultimately get to choose uh, how to apply what's coming up through us, mm -hmm. and to see it with the insight that you drew to it before about, you know, with wonderment, like, you know, I could choose to pull the covers over my head and miss a beautiful sunrise. Right. Uh, things like that and other yeah. things in that along those lines. And you know what else, Helen? Um, you just made me think of something else when you brought up children is, you know, imagine the Venus as a child She's just been born um, and, um, and as the child grows, when they, they, they see things from a different perspective than an adult does. So the child is, um, I remember when I was a child and examining dreams and I would wake up and talk about my dreams, but I realized, and, and this is where the cloak or the wind is coming, you know, if you see the right and the left side of the painting as your parents, um, symbolic of the parents, um, it was when I would talk about those dreams or some sort of intuitive wisdom that I would have, and adults would be saying to me, um, oh, that's cute, or, um, you know, well, dreams are just dreams. It's just something that you do in the nighttime um, or, or something. You know, they wouldn't 
when you're not given any kind of uh, supportive um, wisdom on what the dream is all about or somebody listening to you and saying, tell me more about that dream, then some people could just say, or some children might say to themselves, oh, well, that's stupid. You know, it's just a dream. And that might be where it goes for them. And then as they grow up, they just continue to ignore these things. And then the dreams disappear or they take on no meaning for the child. Um, the same thing with, you know, gut feelings or things like that, like a survivor of abuse and a child learns, you know, don't tell because um, the parents aren't going to listen anyway, or because they've heard positive things stated about that particular perpetrator. And so they've learned, well, everybody looks at them a certain way. So I was bringing that up um, now for myself, just to end this conversation, um, for myself, what I, I didn't allow this to um, stop me from dreaming or trusting my intuitive wish, wisdom. I just learned as a child that for some reason, adults don't understand these things. And so I didn't stop paying attention to my dreams. I just stopped speaking out loud about them. And if I had any kind of intuitive wisdom or, or thoughts about things, I just stopped talking to people about it. And in fact, it wasn't until I became an adult and moved to California where I began to be uh, around people who talked about the same things I was talking about that I finally started saying, oh yeah, I do that too. I dream too. Hmm. Uh, you brought up something that I think is um, not talked about enough. And that is that inner life that, uh, and I identify with this too, that, well, I'm not gonna talk about this because, you know, they don't seem to get it. Uh, and so also I, I kept quiet about things that I saw, um, just, just in general in life, how people were with each other. <clears throat> and, um, and I did think that there was something wrong with me. I mean, I didn't douse it, you know, it was still there, but I thought, gee, am I the only one who sees things this way? And, and really later, um, growing up and realizing that that inner sense also is like an inner sight for some people. And later, and I noticed in other people in helping them become truer to themselves, what they discovered was that they actually have these inner senses that um, that guide them to help other people and uh, lift their own spirits and uh, that their perspective can zero in and see what's amiss in someone else's uh, experience. You know, when somebody comes and says, what, what do you see? I'm going to tell you a story about me. Tell me what you see so I can know more about, you know, how to handle things. So um, I know there's an inner richness. Uh, and I think the more that we talk about it and more people feel better talking about their intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, and also sometimes I'm thinking now, that intuition has been demeaned in favor of logic. And they, those are not mutually exclusive things, even though it appears that way. They can be used together. They can be used together. You can have your intuition and direction and then use logic and, uh, you know, left brain function to make choices, uh, reasonable and wise choices about different situations. So I see it as working together and it's not either or. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And well, you're a very open-minded person and, um, and you're, and you're able to look at the bigger picture rather than just narrowing it down. It has, there's one way or the highway mm -hmm. kind of thing or black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So can you give an example of how, how does somebody do logic and intuition and bring it together? Well, first of all, I think a person needs to appreciate their inner self, which includes your feelings. If you're judging yourself for having too much of this feeling or that, or if you're judging yourself for handling a situation, your know, judgment is part of that ego thing. And it takes on a life of its own until you address it and dismantle it because you would need to be appreciating your intuit, the innate intuition and get in touch with that and also appreciate that you have um, cognitive, uh, logical, um, common sense type of a thing because sometimes people are lopsided. They're only appreciating their thinking ability or only appreciating their intuitive ability. And um, yeah, maybe you have a propensity to more on one side than the other, but we, ha we all have elements of all of it. So I think the first thing would be to get in touch with both sides and appreciate it and dismantle mm -hmm. limiting self-judgment. When you talked about open mind, it's like, and to know that there's a bigger picture. And um you know, already using centering prayer and periods of silence. Um, if a person can do that right off the bat, that is great because that, in a way that we can't see, um, calms our nervous system down. Yeah. You know, and um, some people need to work their way to sitting in silence. Yes. And not judging themselves themselves as if it's themselves for interrupting thoughts mm -hmm. and then to find a way to send those thoughts away in favor of sitting in the silence. Yeah. So I, I see all those things as somehow connected. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, I'm all, you know, as a, as a psychotherapist, uh, uh, as since we both are, um, I use, the concept of doing meditation with people all the time. I don't advocate centering prayer to people because that's, um, I think somebody, I mean, that would be pushing, they might think I'm pushing religion, so I don't do that. But I do push meditate, I don't push, but I, I do advocate for- <laughs> Oh, maybe a little. Do it. <laughs> I do advocate- Meditate, everybody meditate. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I know, but whenever I'm talking to people, I have anxiety, I have depression, I have this, I have that, you know, I incorporate the, the use of um, meditation as a practice. And I try to guide people there by telling them, you know, if they've never done it before, just start with zero to five minutes. Don't try to be a yogi and try to do 20, 30 hour that you're going to see on these meditation apps. Just do zero to five minutes. Just do it a few times a week. Because when you're introducing that to somebody, the concept of, you know, sitting still for five minutes is a lot easier to consider joining than sitting down and seeing 30 minutes to an hour and, and they're going, oh, you know, I can't do that. And then the second thing we talk about when they do it the first time is all the chatter that comes into their head. And I talk to them about, you know, I've been meditating off and on um, now consistently, but in the past off and on for 40 years. And I still have chatter that comes to my mind. And when I read Father Thomas Keating's book and the Cloud of Unknowing, it's it's obvious that even the monks, the uh, the yogis, they have chatter in their mind too. Nobody is perfect, um, and and so it's like with enlightenment, we're striving to get to that silence, 
in that 20 minutes of centering prayer or five minutes of meditation, we're striving to get to that place. That's like we are striving to reach enlightenment, to attain enlightenment, right? And I think that um, and there are some of us and some of us, you may be watching this, who can't sit still for a second. And uh, if this interests you, you can start. And there's a million things on the internet. Relaxation exercises, how to relax your physical body. That's one thing. There's uh, guided meditations and not all of them are for everyone. So you sample and you find which ones resonate with you. Yeah. Um, certainly you can find Janine or me and you know, we'll help you. Um, and, and this is something you can find your way, even just having the idea that that will be helpful. Yes. Yeah. Or, a, or a local person, you yeah, know, your yeah. local yoga teacher mm -hmm. or meditation teacher, mm -hmm. or spiritual teacher, or whatever. Um, I think it's, uh, it's so fascinating for me when people do listen and, and they, they do try the meditation and then they come back and they say, um, wow, that was, you know, it was really amazing. I made my day feel a little bit better after I did that. And, and I love hearing stories of how people incorporate it in their day, such as um, a teacher I once worked with, once all, the once all the children left at the end of the day, the classroom, what he would do is he would sit in the classroom and do a meditation mm. before getting in the car and driving home to the next part of his day, which was his family. So I thought that was brilliant. Um, and somebody telling me, a woman saying that um, she did it in her car in the garage, not with the door Engine down. Running. Right. No, no, not with, well, not with the door down, but um, she did it in the car because that was a silent place before going into the house to the chatter of the children right. running all over the place and the husband and what have you. So that's how she did it. And so I try to tell people things like, you know, when you're taking a lunch break, use five minutes of that because it doesn't take you an hour to eat. Um, or when you have a coffee break. When I used to work in social services, um, we would join these walking groups. So we would um, take our 15 minute break, walk around the neighborhood, come back. And it, oh my gosh, it was so amazing how you could end, how you could have a much better day after doing that walking meditation because um, you had a chance to, to just stretch your legs, let it out, get out in the sunshine um, because it was California. <laughs> So get out in the sunshine and come back to your desk and you just felt like a completely different person. Mm, mm. And there's also even like, um, uh, I had a, a little book that um, a person's son gave to me one year um, for Christmas. It's called Desk Yoga. And that was also a wonderful thing. Um, it's a form of meditation doing yoga at your desk that um, stretching your body in different ways, it helped to um, make your day go a lot nicer as well. No, I think that's terrific. Um, uh, sometimes people come to me and they say, I can't relax at all. And I would say, well, have you ever been on a vacation where you could relax? Oh, on vacation, I can relax. So if, and there are some people who can't relax even on a vacation. So you want to appreciate where you're at so that you can address and, and help yourself um, exactly where you're at. So if you're able to relax on a vacation, then you can definitely build on that. Um, That's a good one. Yeah. So, um, and otherwise you can still learn something new, like people learn how to play the piano. So you start with some, some principles and you introduce them and you practice them and then you get better and better at it. Yeah. Well, and that's actually when I'm talking to military um, people in my office, I'll say, well, 
you know, don't you remember when you went to boot camp, um, you were being taught to do something brand new every single day. And you had to um, practice over and over and over again. You didn't walk in the door and suddenly know how to march. You didn't walk in the door and suddenly know how to use the artillery artillery or drive the tank or what have you. You had to do a lot of practicing over and over again. And they get it immediately. Right. As right. soon as I say boot camp, it's like, you know, that image right. is right there in their head and they get it. Meditation means it's a discipline. It's something that you have to practice doing each and every day. And um, and then you will begin um, you'll begin to notice results in your life. So and uh, interesting enough that you would bring up the term discipline. So in my life, discipline had a very negative connotation. And as a younger person, so then I attached lots of limiting negative negative thoughts to the term discipline. Oh. When it was brought to my attention that there are many things in my life that I do over and over again because I enjoy them. So that's discipline. <laughs> so, so once I took the negativity out of it, I went, oh, it's just doing something over and over again that you just get better and better at. Oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so yeah. that's an example of a person having like um, a thought attachment to something that keeps them, that kept me from being open to learning some new things. Mm -hmm. So once I had that awareness, then uh, it opened up. So. Yeah, and I, I think that is what happens when we're in practice as therapists, that um, there are words that are gonna come up all the time that we have no idea um, people have an attachment to in some negative way. And unless they tell us, how are we going to know? Um, so the, for those of you who are viewing this, look at yourselves that way. You know, it's like, what, what erroneous thoughts do I have? What, what am I keeping myself from? Mm -hmm. um, and you can ask, and even if you're not in touch with your inner voice, um, or that inner wisdom, you can actually ask a question of that inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, what am I not seeing? What am I not being honest about in myself? And that doesn't mean you're going to find out something awful, it just means you're going to find out something that's like a key that opens up like a little path um, that can be very soothing and relaxing. And if you're listening, as you're listening, not if you're listening, because obviously you are, um, as you're listening, when you're hearing us talking about this, these words, be open and honest with your therapist, because that's what we're here for. Um, we, we can't read your mind. We're not, you're not visiting a psychic, you're visiting a psychotherapist. And so um, I love it when people are honest with me and they say, you know, I've had people say, you were too abrupt with me when you brought up that particular topic and I almost didn't come back. And so then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you did come back. How brave of you to, um, to decide, well, I'm going to give her one more chance and I'm going to tell her this, even if they said it in an email, which oftentimes that's how I hear it. Um, but I love it when they come back because then... Yeah. It's like this person's ready. They're ready to work um, because the person who disappears and doesn't even tell me that word you said or the way you looked at me or that outfit you had on um, or even many, many years ago when I first started a PTSD client, which is what I specialize in, um, a PTSD client said to me, um, when you put that clipboard on your lap, it triggers me. They might not have used that word, but they, they told me, and then they told me a story about it. I mean, it can be anything. And so, um, you know, you have to really, it, the, the therapy session is meant to be uh, a dance between the therapist and the, and the uh, client. Um, I'm not just there for your viewing pleasure, you know, I'm there 
to work with you. I have to understand, you have to tell me what's happening. I have to be able to um, decide what, what does that mean? And, and, and I have to work with you on what that means. And we work together. So that's why it's a dance. Um, and that's some terms, uh, Dr. Arnie Mandel, who I love, absolutely love. He's a, a wonderful somatic psychologist. Um, he talked about getting in the bath water with the client. And um, so I don't know if I like using that terminology so much. <laughs> that sounds a little bit too intimate for me, but I don't, I love to dance. So I like using the term dancing because it is uh, the way we move around the room um, verbally uh, is, is going to make something happen in that session. And in the preceding sec sessions, um, it's going to change people's life. And, and sometimes it has to come from their intuitive wisdom, uh, telling us their gut feelings about how they reacted to something that I said, um, which can then open the door to, well, where did you, where do you remember hearing that the first time? Where was the first time somebody um, gave you that look or had that clipboard or um, that scent, you know, maybe as a cologne that I was wearing or whatever. Where was the first time that you remember that memory? And, um, and then that helps them on their path. That is a great um, example. And I have that too. And um, I have some very brave clients. Uh, and so usually I think about them like, wow, all the work they've done is really paying off because they're t telling me and it's hard for them. And then we use that as a springboard for um, them to realize that they have that courage. And in other places where they would like to speak up, they can, and uh, it's just another place to recognize another level of growth. Because mm -hmm. um, that's an issue I think a lot of people have, uh, even, and, and we get the intuition, say this, say this, the thoughts come to us to say, and we don't say them because of all the things in our lives. Either we don't wanna hurt somebody else's feelings or, when we spoke up as a child, the other person came down on us, or maybe we witnessed people being brutalized or punished because they spoke up, or it was our perception that that's what was happening. You know, maybe it was something else that triggered the perpetrator. I don't know. Or, but, um, yeah. or if we say something, they might abandon us. Right, right. Yes. Yes. So actually... By not speaking up, we're abandoning ourselves. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not staying true to ourselves. No, we're not. And if you haven't seen our talk on being true to yourself, tune in to the to talk. talk. That's a good one, too. That's yeah, an amazing talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. What else about intuition? Is there anything else? Um. So if you if you are if you find yourself at the beginning of appreciating um, your inner self, then you might want to consult that "Be Happy No Matter What" book because it takes you in a very soft way through your childhood um, situations where where you might have been turned away from listening and and how to recover some of that appreciating it and then it takes um some courage to follow it first you need to hear it and accept it and then to follow it and then you can um find then how you can be different in relationships and situations you have a lot more command of yourself um that way um Oh, also, um, I did want to mention this. Um, another way to get to 
to begin to notice that inside yourself, that wise thread or vibration, I don't know what, what else you might want to call it. Um, you may have noticed when you were reading something and you get a sense of like, ah, oh, you know, that's something resonating with your inner wisdom. Sometimes you might just get something as a clear yes or a clear no. So it can come to you in a variety of ways, uh, speak to you in a variety of ways. I wanted to mention that. Yeah, and I'll just make a, a note on that. Um, <clears throat> I was talking to somebody recently about dissociating when I read, and um, generally it's a, a psychology textbook, um, which can certainly trigger us <laughs> when it's bringing up stuff from our past <laughs> and what have you. But um, what I have realized about myself that when I have to go back and read that paragraph or that page three or four times, I suddenly say to myself, okay, there's something here that I'm dissociating about that I'm not wanting to read. And so I've just read this entire page or paragraph or sentence and I'm not getting it. I don't, I, I, I can't tell you what I just read. And so now I'll go back mindfully and catch it and highlight it. Mm. And then, and I find it, I always find it when I, you know, tune in and say, all right, what do I need to find here when I tap into my higher wisdom? Um, and then I'll see it and I'll be like, oh, now I know why I was dissociating when I saw that sentence or that paragraph. So I'll highlight it and then that becomes some something that I need to focus on in my life um, and, and think about in my life. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to share uh, about what you just said. So I just happen to have handy something. This is something I'm reading. It's probably for the tenth time. So, so and so for me, um, at this point, it's like, oh my god, my consciousness is still too dense to take this in. So I'm going to read it again and again because I want to get this. Yeah. So you know, um, there's that. Um, yeah, because if, if you, and that is something, that's something that I'm, when I am working with people who have PTSD, um, although dissociation doesn't necessarily only come with PTSD. Right. But, um, <laughs> yes. So just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. Um, but so when I'm talking about dissociation, um, you know, I'm, I'm telling people, I'm talking to people about um, how to ground themselves and maybe create a log to start with when, you know, whenever you have, when you find yourself coming out of that dissociation, writing down, I'm, I'm uh, here in my house, my husband and I just had an argument, um, or I'm driving on the road, and I was going to Cincinnati, and this is what, um, this is what was happening. And just to start them in, in that process of thinking, and so they're able to figure out what was it about that trip? What was it about that um, argument? Um, and of course, with an argument, it's most likely um, the fear of conflict because it means abandonment. That's, that's an, an, an easy one to probably figure out, but it could also mean something else. So um, I try to have people start by being um, conscious of when they are dissociating um, so that they are able to then reframe that how would how would a person know if they're dissociating well they know oh okay is, so is, is, it's an autopilot things to share but what is what can you say to the viewers <clears throat> it's it's um, dissociating and and yeah thank you for uh snapping me out of my uh taking that hat off and and thinking about um needing to explain things sometimes um, so, uh, when I'm asking people if they dissociate, I generally will say, do you ever have times when you sort of space out or you're on autopilot? Um, you don't quite remember that conversation and you're trying to play along when you're in a, in a, at a, um, at a meeting or at a, uh, party or something, 
and you're just kind of like, yeah, yeah, even though you haven't heard a word they said. That's usually what helps people. So the other day, I was having conversation with my beloved husband, and I was talking and talking, and he made a comment. Um, it was like, oh, you know what? Either I know that already or something like that that I could see was totally benign. He was, he, there was no attitude. There was no anything about it. And the next thing I knew, I could not remember what I was sharing. So what ha So I'm going to say that that's an example. Mm -hmm. And what, what I, what, what, where I went next was to myself, what did just happen here? Yeah. Why did you? And then the words I was telling a friend about, I said, you know what? Gary said something and I shut down my, my thinking shut down. And, and I knew that there was something a little different. I, I, I like, it was almost like pulled myself up by my bootstraps because it took all my strength. I went to Gary and I said, yeah, you know what? I know that those things that I was saying to you, you did hear, but that was on my way. It was part of the buildup to what I was going to share with you that I knew that you hadn't heard. This took a lot of strength, Janine, mm -hmm. and a lot of awareness. Yeah, and absolutely. So, and then, and, and I was surprised, this was, you know, this is, I have a teacher who calls this inner research. When you go to a therapist, you're consulting with a person who can see some things from the outside, from what you say. Really, you're going because you're, you're doing fine inner research and you're getting help <clears throat> on how to reinterpret things on the inside mm -hmm. to either lift your spirits, clear your path, uh, let go of things that have been really troubling, and not personalizing, even if horrible things have happened to you, that doesn't mean you're horrible. It just means these things have happened and you need to like, you know, work your way out of sitting in that. Um, so, I, and but this, I was really surprised, Janine, was that, I don't know, whatever the reason was, it was like I got back on track and I could say to him, wait, uh, here, I got the rest of it now. Because when I said to him, I said, I shut down. I was like, I shut down. And he, he was taking it like he did something to shut me down. So I needed to talk to him while I was processing this. I needed to say, no, 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 no. I don't think you did anything. You said something that maybe was familiar in my life from a time where I needed to run away not even in the way that he was saying it. So you know how sometimes you could have a fragrance or a, a look in someone's eye that triggers you. But um, it was really, I was very pleased that um, I, the memory came back of what I was gonna say mm -hmm. and I didn't have to spend a long time. And um, I yeah, think years yeah. ago, I would have actually spent time blaming him. <laughs> And seeing it as if it was his fault, <laughs> not knowing that it was, I'm the one, the feelings are happening inside of me. So. Well, and so you're talking about a mature relationship where you guys have been through so many things. And of course, if you watch our video, staying true, um, uh, staying true to yourself in a healthy relationship. Um, and, and how Ellen and Gary evolved over time. Um, so I wanted to bring up uh, something else in regard to intuition and building that intuitive wisdom that we haven't talked about. And that is, um, I mean, we've sort of glanced around it, but I wanted to give an example to um, discuss it a little bit more as we end our conversation on this. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a, um, at a meeting and I was listening to someone uh, talk about their intuition. And they were saying that um, they had been, uh, they were basically saying, 
um, that their intuition told them not to go to this neighbor next door, to stay away from this neighbor, right? But in reality, what was happening was that it was really their ego was telling them this. And I'll tell you why. Because that person prefaced, prefaced the story by talking about how she didn't like the neighbor. And there was all these things about the neighbor did this and the neighbor did that. And then suddenly she introduced and said, but my intuition told me not to go there. Well, so that's where you, you have to check yourself when you're using the terms intuition. Is it your intuition? Or is it your ego? Because it's not a gut feeling when you already have made judgments about something. It's not a gut feeling. Mm -hmm. It is your ego. But the intuition is when something is just not taking you there. And so the difference with that is I lived somewhere in California. I'm not going to say where because of um, what I'm going to say. But anyway, I was living somewhere in California and there was a bakery that was in the neighborhood. And I always thought, oh, it'd be interesting to go to that bakery. Um, I'd like to check it out. But I never went there. Something kept pulling me away from the bakery. And I could never figure out, I mean, I didn't put much thought into it. But then one day, um, the, um, the owners of the bakery were charged with, um, trafficking and, um, doing some really bad stuff. That's why I didn't want to say the neighborhood, but anyway, um, cause it's very well known, but anyway, um, so as soon as that happened, and this is what I mean by saying something's telling you to turn right and you don't know why it's telling you to turn right. And you've just got to trust it. Because something was something kept me from walking in that door over and over again. And, and I kept thinking to myself, oh, I'd like to go there. I'd like to go there. But something kept walking me, me from walking in that door. And, and it's because something not, not so good was happening there. And, um, and I wasn't supposed to be a part of that energy. Hmm. I just wanted to share those two different scenarios. I've got plenty of others, but I just wanted to stick with two. So, so in the first, mm -hmm. for me, it would be like to tell the difference between the ego and the intuitive wisdom could be very challenging for a person. Mm -hmm because they might not be clear yet about um, the wisdom part. So, you know, they hear the voice part, but they might not be clear about the wisdom part. And so one of the things that I hear you suggesting, which I support for anyone is to keep questioning keep questioning and to and to use as a, as a guide you know the fact that i don't like this person and so it's okay to accept that you're not going to go over there cuz you don't like the person it doesn't have to be mixed up with an intuition yes and that you know if you can let yourself off the hook at that in that way and then let's say you develop a curiosity about that person beyond your judgments of them and you go to reach out to them and you make some plans with them but those plans keep getting changed and you never seem to get connected not just because of you but because of them well, then the energy might suggest that you're not supposed to get together with them. Or it could be that you're being stalled for a reason. Maybe because the two of you are evolving as people. And by the time you are brought together, 
when that day mm. comes, when you're finally able to get together for lunch, you have both just come to this place in your life where you're ready to meet with each other and start talking where you're at at that place versus where you were when you first moved into the neighborhood. I think that is so brilliant what you're saying because it, it brings up the point that there's many possibilities for the situation. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a great thing for any time you feel stuck in a relationship or in, in trying to do something or trying to stop doing something. It's like, if you could just see it in one additional way, if you can open your mind to allow one other possibility, then your mind is open. And yeah. over time you could consider, oh my God, this is one idea I'm having. That doesn't mean that you're running headlong into the neighbor's house when you may have had reasons to take care of yourself or protect yourself. It just means that you don't want to be limited by any of your own limiting thinking. And that there's always a lot more in the situation than it appears. Yes. I mean, that's just a good good thing to keep in mind no matter what. Yeah, yeah. This just, it's always about trusting your higher power, your God, whatever it is you call it, God is, <clears throat> it's about- Sometimes it's called your true self. Your true self, your intuitive wisdom. Your highest, highest thinking, highest wisdom. And developing that so you are able to discern the difference between ego and intuition so that you are able to be guided in a direction that is going to um, be good for you. And a word that may work for some people, there's developing and cultivating. You okay. know, there's, that's another thing that I found for myself is sometimes I need to hunt for the word that has exactly the, the a tune in that, uh, that I can use like a key to get myself to move forward. So that's great. Okay. I love what you said. Thank you. I love this. Well, I have, Thanks, I, do. I love these conversations because it's like so exciting to be a part of. And I'm so glad that you wanted to be a part of this. Um, so are we ready to wrap up um, or do you? Yeah, and I would say, which we've said before, is for those of you who are listening, any conversations like this, you can engage in with your friends or family members and you could put, and you don't have to agree, just put a topic on the table. You know, we've never talked about intuition or what, what do you, what's your commentary on relationships? I always like to think everyone is an expert because they've had experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and what, yeah, go ahead. And listen to what they have to say mm -hmm. and think about it. Don't try to go in with I'm right and you're wrong. Listen to what they're saying um, because that's, that's going to help our world <laughs> tremendously right now. If we can listen to each other and think about what they're, where they're coming from, what their thoughts are about it, and is it possible that um, they might have something interesting to say or that, that their opinion is important and that validating each other in what we have to say, um, that's going to help us as a society, as a world, as a community to be stronger is by listening and not judging, having those moments when we can do that. Yeah, yeah. And if you find yourself judging, you might want to check out how much you judge yourself too. So there's all different angles on dismantling our limitations. So yeah, I always Thank like you. to say nobody's right. Nobody's got the right answer and nobody's got the wrong answer. There is no right or wrong. Because we are not the, we're not God. We're not looking over. We can't see the whole picture. Right. So 
I have my view, you have your view. And if we get enough of us sharing them in an open hearted way, then we could see how all these puzzle pieces fit together. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. This has been great. Okay. Thank you everyone for listening and we'll look forward to talking to you in the future on another topic.